that don't know me, my name is Adobe Induka. I am the operations director here. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I feel the love. And also, I'm also on the preaching team. So, here I am. <laughs> um, so, I want to start off with a question. Um, have you had, have God given you a vision or a dream and it has broken your heart because it has not come to pass yet? I know that that is, uh, yes. Um, did you find yourself crying yourself to sleep, you know, just to realize the next morning that the reality is that this, that you're disappointed that it did not come to pass? Man, I found myself doing this literally early this year. Now, the crazy thing about that, though, is in my mind, in my mind, I have given the faith talk. I'm like, listen, it is not time yet. When it's time, it will happen. You know, God is still working on you. There's things that you still need to deal with. You know, this is what I've been saying to myself and I recognize in my mind. However, my heart and my soul was just aching and crying. Like, I couldn't even stop crying. And I just hear my heart asking God, Lord, Lord, how long? Like, how long do I have to wait? When is this going to come to pass? I just found myself doing that. And the interesting thing now is, like, I don't know about you. How many of you are watching the Olympics? Woo! All right. Yes. I've been watching the Olympics. I don't know if you felt the same thing I felt, but I found myself crying a little bit more than usual. Now, I've been watching the Olympics since 96, and that's just been my thing, summer and winter Olympics, okay? But for some reason with this Olympics, I found myself crying a lot. And I'm just like, girl, what's happening? What's going on with you? You know, I don't know if it's because it's after the pandemic and they're watching their families on the screen instead of them being there. I don't know what it was, but I just found myself just crying a lot. And I was like, Lord, why am I crying like this? Like, what's going on? And then the thought came to me. It just something I just realized is I was so happy for the athletes that were actually living out their dream, you know, living out their accomplishment, just to hear them talk about either some kind of injury they were waiting for, the pandemic, their family's not there, but somehow they were able to persevere, and now finally they lived out their dream. There's one athlete that I found so interesting. She ran the women's marathon, okay, and that was her third time in her life running a marathon which happened to be in the Olympics, and she got a bronze medal. Like, what? What is happening? And they literally showed a note that she wrote at age 10 that says, I want to go to the Olympics and win gold. Her third time running the marathon, and she wins a bronze. I'm like, girl, my eyes on you next, next time. My eyes on you. Like, that's, like, that's so amazing to me. Um, so with that, I'm just like, man... That, I mean, I was not envious for the athletes. I was truly happy for them to see them living this out. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm going through something, either emotionally, physically, or just some challenge going on in my life, I always wondered, did Jesus even go through this? Does he even know what, what this feels like? You know, I always wonder about that. So for those of you that have been with us, we have been in the, like, we are going through the Bible this whole entire year, and we're going through them by genre. So Ref Steph kicked us off um, last Sunday in the Gospels. And so I was like, man, let me go in here and see if Jesus can relate to this thing. And honestly, I get so excited when I find a passage of Scripture that can speak to my pain or to my situation, especially if Jesus went through it. So if you have your Bible app, I ain't going to say Bibles. If you have your Bible app, go ahead and click on and go to Luke um, chapter 2. And if you don't, that's okay. It's going to be on the screen. It's going to be Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 41 through 52. And I'll be reading the New Living Translation. I actually like that translation. I think it's pretty cool. Makes things simple. Okay, Luke 2. Verses 41 through 52. And it reads, 
Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss, didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When, when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, my God, now I'm a parent, y'all. I don't know. I don't know how their emotions were going. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Now, I don't know, but like, at least for me recently, especially when I'm reading the Gospels. Now, the Gospels is the story of Jesus, how his humanity and divinity was just interacting on this earth. And the amazing thing for me, at least now that I'm reading this uh, scripture, is trying to figure out when and how did Jesus know when to kick in his divine side and then when to kick in his human side? I always wondered about that. Like, how do you know at in this instance, this is the time to be the son of God? And then in this instance, be the son of Mary. Like, how did he deal with that? And let me tell you, I have come to call Jesus the master of tension. He is the master of tension. Now, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, and you have not found yourself in a tension or two or three or four, I will wonder if the Holy Ghost is really leading you. I am going to wonder that. I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Because our Jesus, he tends to lead us to the gray. Yeah, he leads us to it. And I think he does that on purpose so we have no choice but to lean on the Holy Spirit's wisdom and understanding. I really do. Because in certain situations, yeah, you can do this, but then in certain situations, you have to do that. And it looks like you're kind of contradicting yourself, but you're really not. But you look a fool, but you're like, well, it's not my fault following the Holy Ghost. Like, it's just a thing. It's a thing. You know, I mean, as a baby Christian, you stay in the black and white, of course. But as you grow and the Holy Ghost keep leading you, child, you're like, hold on now. I thought I knew. Mm-mm. Well, Lord, what you just said, wait, let me pray about that. I'm not sure. You know, because at first you would just be like, oh, it's this, 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 this. Now you're like, what did the Holy Ghost say to you? Let's pray about that. You know, you're not quick to give an answer. But he is the master of intention. And look at him, human side, divine, the divine side, living together in this 12-year-old boy. Now, in this story, we are looking at his human side. He's 12 years old. He has this vision and this dream that God the Father has given him. And he is stepping out at age 12. Now, the interesting thing is, he steps out, but it doesn't go according to plan. And honestly, that brings me comfort because it lets me know that the Jesus that I serve, the Jesus that leads me, understands what it's like to step out in the vision and the dream that God the Father has given you, and it did not plan out the first time. 
<laughs> it just didn't plan out. And I can only imagine Jesus' Jesus's face when his parents told him, boy, boy, get home. Coming home, where are you being, Father Siles? Like, first of all, they would look at him all confused. Like, what do you mean by that? No, come home. You know, I don't know if you have told maybe your parents of a vision or dream that God has given you, and they look at you like, uh, let's go where something's safe. See, for me, I'm a Nigerian, so safe in my parents' eyes is either a lawyer, doctor, engineer, you know, nurse. That is safe. Come home to where it's safe. I don't know what you're talking about. Or, you know, I mean, I can imagine how Jesus felt when his parents looked confused. They just didn't understand what he was talking about. Do you have people in your life that do not understand the vision and dream God gave you? More importantly, do you understand <laughs> the dream and vision God gave you? I mean, sometimes we don't even understand. Sometimes we think we do, but we really don't. And Jesus thought he understood it. Like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. But no, he did not. Neither did his parents. I can imagine the conversation on their way back home. Can you imagine? Now, I'm just assuming because I'm a parent of four kiddos. The age ranges literally from 11 to 19. And if I end up having to look for one for three days, oh, Jesus, Lord, help us. I will be praying on the Holy Ghost. I'm like, Lord, you better, you better help me or they're coming back to you. They're just going to come back to you. You better help me, Lord Jesus. Help me. Help me. They're, not, or they're about to give you a heart attack. So I can imagine the conversation, the frustration, the anger, and the sadness, you know, in their, in their voice. And the amazing thing about that, though, is, you know, Jesus listened and went back with them. The last two verses literally grabbed my attention. So let's go with the first one, verse 51, which says, Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all this in her heart. Jesus did not throw a tantrum. Jesus did not use, I am the son of God card. He didn't do that. No, he, like, he didn't even say, do you know who I is? Like, who are you talking to? He didn't do none of that. He returned to them, obeyed them, and stayed with them. And I, it honestly blows my mind how humble our Lord Jesus is. How humble. Like, I don't know about you, but I will have something smart to say back. But this is why I'm not Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's why I need deliverance, amen. This is why I need the Holy Ghost, amen. But, you know, didn't, say, didn't even say anything back to them. It was just like, okay, went back at age 12. And, of course, Jesus did not step into his vision till he turned 30. This is 18 years later. Amazing, mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. In verse 52, this one hits home for me. This hits home for me. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people. Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginner and uh, finisher of our faith, the one who is called the Word of God, the Lamb of God, the Good Shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life, this Jesus had to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God, for real? I thought that should have been automatic. But he had to grow in that. Now, let me break this down for you. I had I to, to dig into this. I went to the Bible dictionary and trying to figure out, okay, how does, what does the Bible say about wisdom, stature, and favor? So with wisdom... It says, it is often associated with trust in and fear of God. Now, fear here is not like, oh, my God, I'm afraid. But fear as in respect, reverence. And Jesus had to grow 
in trusting God, how to grow in fearing God. Wow. I was mind blown. Let me tell you something. I honestly thought this should be, this should be automatic. I should be able to trust in God real good. I should be able to fear him real good. Like, I did not know this was a growth process, that it doesn't come automatically. And for Jesus, I thought it would come naturally, but he had to grow in that. That comforted me because that means, child, you're okay. You're okay. It takes, it takes time. Second one is stature. And in this verse, stature is used to show the weakness of humanity and the need to rely on God. Jesus had to grow in relying on God. Y'all, let me tell you something. This was preaching to me. I'm honestly in shock. Jesus had to grow in relying on God the Father? Are you serious? But he's God the Son. He is God in flesh. But you tell me, but he had to grow? To rely on God the Father? For real? Next one is favor. Favor is looking kindly upon someone or treating someone with special regard. Favor can be gained by means of good character, gifts, service, or through the intervention of God. Now, favor is not the same thing as favoritism. I had to distinguish that. In the book of James, we are warned against that. James um, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our gracious Lord Jesus Christ? If you favor some people over others. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. And another comes in, comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you have given special attention in a good seat to the rich. But you have said to the poor, to the poor one, you can stand over there. Or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discriminate show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? So favoritism is guided by evil motives. Favor is definitely given by God through the means of good character, gifts, and service. Now, the question then that comes to my mind is, how did Jesus handle the challenging growth season in his life? And what can we learn from him? So there are three things. First, keep seeking God in the waiting. Meaning, get to know the God who gave you the vision and the dream. God wants you to fall in love with the giver, not the gift. Not the vision, not the dream. And that takes time. It takes time to get to know someone, especially a heavenly father who is spirit. That takes time to get to know him. Know him for who he is, not for what your parents say, your pastors say, your background say, your religion background say. No, 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 no. Get to know him for who he is. Not to get to know him through your own disappointment, through your own need. No, no, no. Who he is, what, what his character is. Second is trust God even when you and others don't understand what is on your own heart. Trust him. Trust him. Jesus' parents were confused and didn't understand him. Jesus definitely understood things differently. And I can tell he did because at age 12, he was at the temple But when he turned 30 and started his ministry, he was in the streets. He was not in the synagogue. So there's something that happened between age 12, age 30. In those 18 years, there's a growing that he did that he was like, you know what? For me to start this, I have to be on on the street. I can't be in the synagogue. 
Every disciple he chose did not come from a synagogue. None of them were priests. Have you ever thought about that? None of them. So there's something he learned in 18 years. So yeah, at 12, he thought he's supposed to start in the synagogue. But no, by the time he was old enough and grew into this vision, he then understood, no, I have to start this ministry outside of the synagogue. Third thing, trust the process. God is the one who gave you the vision. He is the one that gave you the dream. He is going to do the work to qualify you. He's not calling you because you're already qualified. No, that's not how our God works. He calls those that he himself will qualify. Not that you qualify. You have to trust his process. And let me tell you something. His process sometimes will not make any kind of sense. But that's why he's God. Just trust him. Trust and obey. Trust and obey and be patient with him. At this time, I want to invite Nathan up. And as Nathan plays, I want, I want you to please close your eyes. And I want you to take this time to really sit. And for those of you who are waiting on a vision and a dream that God has given you and it hasn't come to pass yet and you find yourself hurt because you have tried and tried and each time you meet disappointment, you meet failure, I honestly want you to take this time to sit with God and bring the disappointment to him, bring the heartbreak to him, bring the sadness to him, the embarrassment, the shame to him. Let him have it. Let him have it. So do me a favor, close your eyes. At this time, I want you to ask God to please help you see his process, what he's trying to do in your life right now. Ask him to give you his perspective on what you thought was a failure, on what you thought was a disappointment. Let him speak to your heart. Ask him what is he trying to teach you in this season. For some of you, perhaps you feel stuck. You feel like you're not even doing the vision or the dream ask him what is he teaching you right now perhaps in the job that you have right now at your home neighborhood within your family friends co-workers even yourself what he's trying to teach you What is God showing you through your thought life and your emotions? What do you find that's in your mind right now? What is going through your mind? What is the dominant emotion happening to you right now? And what is God saying through those thoughts? What is God saying through the emotion you're feeling right now? Some of you, perhaps you have a wall. You don't even want God to get into it because honestly you are so hurt by him so much so that you are angry with him I know this sounds crazy but I want you to say to God Lord I forgive you because you first forgave me I've let go the hurt and I've let go the anger towards you and then ask him to help you to understand your disappointment, your sadness, and your shame, and your embarrassment. Ask him for understanding. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for stature. Ask him for favor. Not only with him, but with people. 
if he did it for Jesus, he can absolutely do it for us. Please do not give up. There are people depending on your obedience. God is making you. Key word is making you. God is making you an answer to people's prayer. Pay attention to the lessons the Holy Spirit is teaching you. Pay attention to your life. Pay attention to the people God brings into your life and also those that are fallen off your life. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to things that grab your attention that seems random. Pay attention to that. The Holy Spirit could be talking to you or showing you something in that. Stay alert to what the Holy Spirit might be saying or doing. Pay attention to the thoughts that come to your mind, the impressions you get in your heart. Maybe a child said something, you wonder, huh, wonder why my child said that. Pay attention to that. Or a friend out of nowhere calls you or texts you, you're like, hmm, I've never heard from this friend in a long time. I wonder why that is. Or maybe you started thinking of somebody you've never thought about in 10, 15 years. And you wonder, huh, I wonder why this person's in my mind. Pay attention to that. God has wonderful ways of talking to us, speaking to us, nudging us. Because you know we are all different. He has his way. He knows. Please continue to stay faithful. Continue to fight the good fight of faith. Because there are people who are on the other side of your obedience that need to know that God is real and he answers his prayer. And he tends to do that through people. So stay faithful. Amen? Amen. God bless you.